We are going to look at the countdown numbers game. So I used to teach uh, programming and I used to teach the countdown letters game. Uh, and that worked out quite well. I always like teaching to the, to the problem, not the tool. So it was quite nice to have that focus of the countdown letters game. And I was always thinking next year I'll do the numbers game because I'll be able to work that out and find a solution to that. And over the years, I didn't really find one. So what I ended up doing was brute forcing the entirety of the countdown numbers game. So I've simulated every single possible game that can ever happen within countdown numbers. Countdown is a uh, a television show focused around the letters game predominantly but you have the numbers game as well and what you have to do is you have to pick six numbers and with those numbers you have to achieve a target score by adding multiplying dividing and subtracting it's got to be a three-digit number so between 100 and 999 so they actually pick they pick big and small numbers so big numbers are 25 50 75 and 100 and small numbers are 1 to 10 and they pick two big numbers and four small ones, and then you have your six numbers, and then you have to go and make a target number with those. One big number. Okay, we're gonna give you a hundred. Um, the rest small, go rest on. Small. Should we, one, two, four, five, and seven. We're gonna make a target, and let's have a think. Go on. Well, I'll pick a number off my screen right now. The duration remaining on one of my memory cards is 226. 226. So you've got to make 226 using these numbers. I can see that straight away. Two times 100. Yep. And then you've got the six is the one and the seven. Yep. And then you've got four times five is 20, right? Yeah, you've, you've solved it. You, so, you've done it there. So yes, this is the basic crux of the game. So there are some things we can do and some things we can't do. We can't concatenate numbers. So we can't put two and four together and make 24. We can't ever go into negative numbers and we can never use decimals. Uh, and one more thing to say, the solution doesn't have to use all the numbers. I think you used... I used all of them. Used all of them, you don't have to. Yeah, and I decided to brute force this, which seems, I think, a little bit less difficult than it actually was. So we, we hopefully have some interesting statistics at the end of this, but... Um, so what, the goal of what we had to do is we have to mix up every single possible number, every single board permutation that can happen, with every sim single symbol that that can happen to. So plus, minus, multiply and divide, which results in a, in a lot of numbers. So we've got some of them here. So assuming we have just six random numbers, and then what we need to do is we need to find a way of putting add, minus, subtract and divide in here. We're gonna also need to use five symbols, okay? So we'll just tack these on at the end. So plus, minus, multiply, plus, and divide, okay? We need to find a way of combining these in every single possible combination. So I tried many ways of doing this because if you have, for example, a sum like this, this can be interpreted in many different ways. So for example, if we put brackets here, that means we do this operation first. So that means we do five minus three, which is two, minus two, which equals zero. If we have the same sum and we put the brackets here, we do three minus two first, which equals one, and then subtract that away from five, which equals four. So we need a way of representing which way we need to go about doing this. So ultimately, when I was programming this, I had to solve this problem and make sure things were interpreted in the correct way. So what we did is we, did, we used something called reverse Polish notation, which luckily you've got a couple of videos on. RPN, reverse Polish notation. It saves the interpreter or the compiler an awful lot of effort. So just to give you an example of how this works, which is quite good when it comes to how I've written this at the top. This equation here, so five minus three in brackets minus two zero, would be written as five, three, minus two, minus. The second equation is written as five, three, two, minus, minus. So the actual order of where the symbols come up denotes how the equation is going to be handled. Once this was solved, it means we didn't have to deal with brackets because I did try dealing with brackets and that was just a nightmare. This means what we can do is we can actually have our six numbers here and five either five symbols of which what we're going to do with it, plus minus all of that. And then what we can do is we can just shuffle them, go through every single permutation of this list. Even what you've written there looks like quite a daunting prospect. Yeah. Never mind the entire numbers game. It is daunting. It's daunting 
because you've also, this isn't all of the combinations of symbols you can use either. So we've got to deal with that as well. Now, there are 11 things here. So in order to shuffle these, it would be 11 factorial, which is close to 39 million. But we've got an issue here because we're only using this, these symbols, and there are lots of possible symbols we could use in here. And what I found was there's actually 54 sets of different symbols we use if we only care about the count of each symbol, as in how many there are in the set. We don't care about the order because everything's being shuffled anyway. There were 54 individual sets of these that we could get. So when you say that, you mean it might be plus, 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 minus, minus, it might be plus. Yep, divide, divide, exactly. Divide. And we've got to, because we're brute forcing the entire countdown system, we want to find every single way it can get every single number. The amount of possible combinations we can have is 11 factorial times 54. 11 factorial is 39 million. 54, I think I've got it written down here is, it's 2.155 billion. So you're thinking this is quite big, and then we have another issue. This is only one set of board numbers we've got here. So there are 1,343 boards. So it's actually 2.155 billion times 1,343, which is a lot. This took a long time. So on my home PC to do one of these, one set of numbers took about two and a half hours. Two and a half hours times 1,343 is a long time. So we ran into some issues here, but we got it done. So um, some things that helped, um, we have the Computer Vision Lab at Nottingham who lent me their cluster for a little bit. That's the same cluster that did Hashcat with Mike Pound and also the digital research team. Without their help, I wouldn't have gotten this done in a reasonable time frame. Um, and I'm talking like over a year probably of using two cores of my computer um, and that's just annoying and not something I'm willing to do. So yes, we did it. And having done this and done every single um, possible countdown numbers um, game that can ever happen, we've got some, some statistics on some, some numbers, some good, some bad, and I can tell you some things about them. We can talk about what the easiest and hardest target numbers to make. So because we know um, every single possible countdown numbers game, we can work out how many sets of board numbers could solve every single target. So some will be harder than the other. Um, so the easiest number to make in countdown, the target number that most sets of board numbers can make, that's available to them if they do the right maths. Um, I want to go crazy and say something like 999, but no, maybe 100, 100. Exactly. So yep, it's 100. There are actually four numbers that can um, that, that share the easiest, the easiest to make, and they are 100, 102, 104, and 108. 13,240 of all possible boards can make these numbers. There's one absolutely useless board, which is 112233, which cannot make a number over 100. So not a single solution can be made with that. So if that ever comes up, you're, you're in trouble. And then we're getting on to the hardest one. So the hardest number um, to make is the one that is possible, uh, the one that can be solved by the fewest number of boards. Is it a large okay. prime or something? It sounds like it. I don't know if it's a prime, but I guess it might well be. Yeah. Go on, just have a guess. 997. Good enough. Um, it's 900 and f 947. Yep. So 947 is the hardest, and that can only be, um, that can only be made by 9,017 boards. One thing that I did deduce from this, which I think is probably quite obvious, but I did check, is that even numbers are much easier to make than odd numbers, and it's very statistically significant. So if you get um, an even target number, you're very much more likely to be able to solve that, which is something, something nice to know. The countdown exists between numbers of 100 and 999. And for any given board numbers, we could be assigned any target number in this range if any at all, how many sets of board numbers do you think can make every single number continuously on this line? So it can make 101, 102, 103, all the way up to 999. Uh, I don't know, not very many. 100? So when I did it, I wasn't sure if there'd be any, but there's actually 1,226 of them, which is about 10%, which is a lot more than I thought. Um, is there a common factor? Is there something you kind of need to have the perfect, you know, like, a big number. Yeah, so I think, I don't, I don't have any exact stats on this, um, but a big number definitely helps. Um, you can tell with the file sizes that come up, the files are stored or the, the, the results are stored as the, the board numbers. And by looking at them, you can see that generally, if you don't have a big number, there's less, there's less data in the files. So big numbers definitely help, but too many big numbers. So 
four big numbers becomes a bit of a detriment. So somewhere in between there's a sweet spot, I would imagine one or two. We needed a, a lot of computational resources to do this, to solve this problem. And one of the things was, was trying to move it from my desktop computer to a cluster so it could do more computation. So essentially the way my program worked is it created a text file, which was the board numbers, so six numbers, dot text. And then inside that, it has every single um, solution that can be made from those six numbers. That's generally how it worked. Now, when you're running one instance of that program, it's fine because everything's just in a loop, it iterates through. Now, if you want to split that problem up, there are probably some very nice ways of doing it. But essentially what I did is um, I changed it. So what it would do is it would have a list of all the files it knew it was gonna generate because it knew all the board numbers. And what it would do is it would look inside the folder and if a file isn't there, it would then start generating that file and put a lock on it so that no one else can, can go and do that file. And if something did try and access that file, another program accessed that file, it would say, you can't use it, so something else is using it. So what it would do, one of the joys of that is, is once you've got that program running, you can run it once and it will just look for a file that isn't there and then create it and then start doing it. And if you ran another instance of the program, it would just do the same thing. And then you can just start adding programs to it until you get, um, I think I used 40 on the CVL cluster. And then on the other cluster I was allowed to use, it got up to about 250, which is a lot. So I wrote it all in C Sharp. Yep. Um, so I had to run it on Linux servers. So I used Mono to do that, um, which is an open source compiler for C Sharp. Nothing terribly complicated. There were lots of arrays, lots of list manipulation, um, but everything was quite straightforward. The servers actually restarted a lot because when you use external servers, what they can do is they, um, you can pay for priority access or non-priority access. If you don't pay for priority access, sometimes they cut it off and say, you can have this back in 12 hours. Someone else wants to use it, which is a bit of a pain. So one thing I did do um, when I was uh, running the programs is what I was doing on my desktop is whenever it found a solution, I'd write it to the text file immediately. But when I was using the cluster, what I'd do is when I was writing to a file, essentially I'd put everything that I was gonna write into a buffer and I, I wouldn't flush it to right at the very end. So essentially the text files it was generating were either empty or finished. And what that allowed you to do is if you wanted to, um, say for example, if you were, you were taking up too much space in a cluster and the admin message you and says, you're using a bit too many, uh, a, a bit too, uh, too much of resources than you said you were going to, you need to clear some of it out. What you could do is you would know which files haven't been written to yet because they've got nothing in them. So you can just delete those files, close the, close the um, processes that are running those files and you won't have any confusion there because if it was writing as it was going along, what you'd find is that some of the files would have data in them, some of them wouldn't. Um, and that was absolutely fine. You could of course do things like just write a little tag at the end of the file. Um, to make sure that um, everything's appropriately finished. I kept on not knowing how long this was gonna take. So this has been scheduled for a few times. I was just doing things quickly, not thoughtfully. Um, so yeah, it, it was a series of less optimal solutions to many problems put together in a program which worked absolutely fine in the end, which is, yeah, nice. And this one. So these two have a little battle and it's this one that wins. We've now got our two parents, which we will draw here. So they were... Awful lot of effort in actually executing the expressions that you write, write down. 